Great. Yes. Okay. Um, let's get started then. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the CDTC New Visions Virtual Learning Series. This um, is a monthly webinar series that we began um, about a year ago as part of the implementation of our Metropolitan Transportation Plan, New Visions 2050. Um, our goal is to kind of shed some light on and go a little bit deeper into topics that we cover in the New Visions Plan, and then provide some how-to, some resources, some data, or just some extra information that you might not be able to get from reading the plan here in the webinar. So I know that we have been on Zoom and doing a lot of virtual stuff for a while now, but just some reminders. Um, if you're a participant in the webinar, your mic is muted and you can see us, we cannot see you. Um, please feel free to use the chat or the Q&A functions, or you can raise your hand and I'd be happy to unmute you if you'd like, if you'd prefer to speak your question. This webinar has been approved um, by the Upstate APA chapter for one and a half CM credits. So if you are AICP, you can um, apply, you can submit your information and you will get a credit. I will send everyone a participation certificate so you can claim those. Um, and if you are a planning or zoning board member and your municipality has, um, has approved CDTC's webinars, you can also get credit for your um, New York State Department of State training requirements. So as I said, each month we have a webinar as part of this ongoing learning series. Next month um, is bike month. So we'll be digging into some bicycle and pedestrian planning resources and um, our website, cdtcnpo.org is continuously updated uh, with new webinar and other information. Previous webinars can be found on our website also. We record all of these and upload them to our CDTC YouTube channel so that people can um, go back and refer to them uh, when they need them. And all of our new vision 2050 documents and materials can also be found on the website. So today, um, we actually unfortunately had a last minute cancellation by a panelist, um, but we will, I will try to cover some of the New York state specific, state the state agency level stuff, but we also have Joe Bavenzi from the Genesee Transportation Council and Lucas Rogers from Albany County Executive's Office who will both talk about um, kind of two different perspectives or two different uh, kind of levels of resiliency planning. Um, Joe will shed some light on what some MPOs like the Rochester area MPO are doing. And then Lucas will talk about what's going on locally uh, in the capital region for resiliency planning. But first I'll just briefly introduce CDTC and New Visions 2050. Most of you already know that the Capital District Transportation Committee or CDTC is a metropolitan planning organization or an MPO. And we are the MPO for New York's capital region. The region includes Albany, Rensselaer, Schenectady County and most of Saratoga County minus that Northeast corner. And it is a transportation policy making and planning organization that allocates federal transportation funding resources to local transportation infrastructure projects and planning programs. And one of our major, major roles and responsibilities is developing and maintaining the Metropolitan Transportation Plan, which we refer to as New Visions 2050. And um, our other two products are the Unified Planning Work Program or UPWP and the Transportation Improvement Program or TIP and that's the five-year capital program. Both the UPWP and the TIP must reflect the core principles and spirit of New Visions 2050, the Metropolitan Transportation Plan. Um, we'll continue to hold our monthly webinars as part of this learning series, but you can also request 
training um, or other types of presentations from CDDC on new visions, whether for your town board, city council, planning board, zoning board, or other entity um, in your community, we would be happy to uh, meet virtually or now in person and um, talk about this plan and how it can be a tool and how CDDC can be a resource for your community. So the New Visions planning and investment principles are the centerpiece of New Visions 2050. These 15 principles influence the types of tasks and initiatives that CDTC supports. And as you can see, um, invest in security um, is its own principle. Um, and within invest in security, we are referring to resiliency, um, but all the other principles in one way or another, kind of point back to resiliency or support resiliency. Additionally, um, there are federal planning factors that are also considered um, in the development of the plan. And one of them is improving the resiliency and reliability of the transportation system and reduce or mitigate stormwater impacts of surface transportation. So just a quick snapshot of the region and why we're talking about resiliency. Um, we are a relatively slow growth region, but despite the slower growth, we've continued to develop and we've kind of developed outward. Um, so we've seen an increase in driving. The regions, uh, our needs are changing, our economy is changing, people's lifestyles are changing. We need to be able to adapt to these changes. We need to be able to provide better transportation choices to um, more people. And we have an extensive infrastructure network. We have over 14,000 miles of roadway, over a thousand bridges, 1,200 miles of sidewalk, um, and over a hundred miles of trails and other bike facilities in the region. And all of these are vulnerable to, um, to hazards, to incidents and to other um, weather events. And we all rely on this large network to get to work, to get to school, to get to medical um, care and to get to other services and to our family and other things in our communities. Um, but going back to the growth, um, the development without growth, and we've seen the increase in driving, we also have seen an increase in greenhouse gas emissions. And as you can see here, the transportation sector in the region is the biggest contributor to greenhouse gas emissions, which is not uh, unique to our region. This is the case for most regions across the country. Um, but an increase in greenhouse gases produces um, a positive climate forcing or a warming effect. So, of course, the main goal of developing a 21st century transportation system is creating, like we said, more green and sus sustainable transportation choices. Like, um, and this includes reducing vehicle trips, electrifying the vehicle fleet, and making it safer and more feasible to walk, bike, or use transit. But we also have to adapt to how these emissions have already changed our climate and will continue to. This means increasing um, the extreme weather events that we see, rising sea levels, which could affect capital region communities along the Hudson and Mohawk, Mohawk rivers, as well as other water bodies and then floodplains. So how can we reduce disruptions to mobility and to the transportation system to this large network that we already have um, in any given event, hazard, or other incident. This is what we mean by resiliency, the ability to prepare and plan for, absorb, recover from, or more successfully adapt to adverse events. Um, and these are just some, some photos, some pictures of facilities, infrastructure in our region that have within the last two years been impacted by extreme weather. Um, and we're seeing this more and more, and this is why this is uh, a priority for CDTC. But even most recently, um, the transportation system has been disrupted by the global pandemic. In the spring of 2020, we saw travel demand plummet, 
many people were out of work or uncertain um, about their work futures. And we saw our transportation infrastructure transform itself to deliver goods and services, whether it was food pantry pickups at the airport, delivery of meals by transit buses that weren't being used to bring people to work anymore, for use of CDTH trolleys and other vehicles to get people to vaccination sites. Um, there was a high demand on the transportation system to adapt to a new normal. And even other big facilities and infrastructure also adapted, like New Albany was a COVID testing site, parking garages and other parts of the country were used as overflow. Hospitals and other staging areas, streets were transformed to allow for socially distant recreation. And even now large obsolete retail spaces are being used as vac vaccination centers. So our goal is whether it's a pandemic, whether it's a weather event um, or other sort of hazard or incident, our goal is to ensure that our transportation system can adapt to and respond to other types of incidents. Um, and the one thing we are increasingly experiencing is major weather events that cause flooding or damage to the transportation system. Um, so while all of these things, whether uh, hazards, economic issues, pandemics are all things that we need to be prepared for. The one thing that we're seeing increasingly is the effects of major weather events. So the three goals of resiliency are adapt, reorganize, and evolve um, the transportation system into a more desirable configuration that's better prepared for hazards and future impacts of climate change, provide reliable services, drivers, transit riders, pedestrians, bicyclists, freight shippers, air travelers, and even tourists for value, reliability, and the efficient use of their time. And then reduce, continue to promote the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions from transportation, whether that's from reducing vehicle trips altogether or electrifying um, or greening our transportation system in other ways. Um, so the Justice 40 initiative, I wanted to touch on this. This was established by the Biden administration to ensure that federal agencies work with states and local communities to make good on the promise to deliver at least 40% of the overall benefits to underserved um, communities. Guidance continues to be released at the federal level on Justice 40 and um, CDTC monitors this um, and we are will implement it at the MPO level. It highlights the importance, this Justice 40 highlights the importance of social connectedness, of understanding who lives in our communities. So, you know, we're gonna talk a lot today about infrastructure and systems, but also people and populations are also part of resiliency. Um, so who lives in our communities and what are their needs in any given emergency? This may include aging populations, households with low incomes, children and racial or ethnic minorities. Not everyone or every community has the capacity or resources to respond, adapt or recover from events. Um, and we must make sure that all populations in the capital region are um, considered. So as part of the implementation of New Visions 2050, CDTC will spend the next several months collecting data and identifying models that help us identify vulnerable infrastructure. So whether it's a bridge or culvert or a major transportation facility that may be located in a floodplain or other vulnerable area, our goal is to identify all of these assets. Then the next steps are to develop a climate adaptation and resiliency plan to protect these assets and to determine how we can rebuild or preserve the existing system and the region's assets to withstand disruptions and incidents. Um, and we also will identify populations that may be most vulnerable to failures in the transportation system as a result of extreme weather or other um, events and develop a plan for CDTC to assist in the coordinating of organizations, agencies, and communities to make sure there's a swift response and recovery. So um, Elizabeth Lennon works for the New York State Department of Transportation and she can't be with us here today, but she did want me to touch on some of um, the things that are happening at the state level. So starting in March, 2015, public infrastructure projects in New York, including those that are 
constructed, funded, or approved by the New York State Department of Transportation must be evaluated on their resiliency to sea level rise and future extreme weather events. The New York State Community Risk and Resiliency Act requires state agencies to consider climate change impacts in funding and permitting decisions. Um, and in August, 2020, New York State released guidance for consideration of flood risk and smart growth public infrastructure assessment, which lays out smart growth criteria to be used by state public agencies when approving, undertaking, supporting, or financing public um, infrastructure projects. So at the state level um, and at DOT, the vulnerability to, to flood risks and other um, storm and other hazards is being considered before things are built, before things are approved. And when things are built, they are bu being built to um, withstand uh, expected types of extreme weather or incidences. So we are building a more resilient transportation system. New York State is also working on integrating a resiliency screening tool um, that will be part of the Smart Growth Checklist. Other programs um, and things related to resiliency, uh, New York State DOT has the Green Lights program. Green Lights stands for Green Leadership and Transportation Environmental Sustainability. Um, it encourages the protection and enhancement of the environment, better public involvement in the planning and design process, and integrated smart growth and other sound land use practices into transportation planning and design. Um, so it encourages communities to, um, to build a better, better infrastructure. And New York State's uh, own highway design manual has been updated to include considerations for adaptation and resiliency and other uh, design guidance like the Ashto Green Book have, we're anticipating um, the updated version and it's anticipated that it will include uh, good information on resiliency and adaptation, stormwater management and things that will be of interest to a lot of communities right now. And then if you are a community and you're looking to develop your own local hazard mitigation plan or resiliency plan, there's a lot of data and information available through um, the New York State Hazard Mitigation Plan. So the New York State Division of Homeland Security and Emergency Services partnered with the AVAIL lab team at UAlbany to develop a data visualization and analytics tool um, to assess and evaluate the impacts of natural hazards in New York State. So this tool, the website mitigatenewyork.availlabs.org um, provides an overview of the state mitigation plan and the strategies for reducing impacts of natural hazards, but it also outlines, outlines all of the hazards and risks New York State faces. Um, there's historical data on costs and damages and repairs um, from weather events. There's data on risk and injuries, fatalities, and other important data to help you develop local hazard mitigation or resiliency plans. So with that, I'm gonna pass it to Joe Bovenzi to talk about um, how GTC has identified vulnerable infrastructure in their region. Okay, thanks, Jen. Uh, let me um, see if I can share my screen here. Uh, let's see. Share. Okay, can you guys see my title slide? Yes. I think we can, okay, great. So. I will, uh, I will get right into it. Um, so just quickly by way of background, my name is uh, Joe Bovenzi. I'm a transportation planner with the, uh, the Genesee Transportation Council, which is the MPO for the Rochester area. So I'm sort of, um, we're sort of like CDTC's uh, sister cousin uh, organization just for, uh, for Rochester and the nine counties. Um, and one of my areas of responsibility is uh, infrastructure resiliency and vulnerability planning. So this, um, the next slide here, just to kind of set the uh, set the, the stage, if you will, for the work that we do, our planning region encompasses nine counties in Western New York, um, focused on the city of Rochester and Monroe County, which is where most of the, the residents and the jobs and the, the infrastructure is. But our planning region is actually quite extensive. It's about uh, 4,700 square miles with about 1.2 million residents. 
um, at about 540,000 jobs. Um, manufacturing and uh, agriculture are, are key industries. Um, and sort of like the Albany area, we expect very modest uh, population growth over the next uh, next few decades. Um, so we've got quite a few uh, recreational and cultural resources. Uh, you know, the Finger Lakes are, uh, well, uh, eight of the 11 Finger Lakes are within our region, uh, Letchworth Park, um, the Erie Canal uh, Heritage Corridor, and quite a few other parks and uh, historical sites and other uh, sort of tourist destinations and attractions. Um, and we also have a quite a, a diverse area in terms of our, our land use, uh, ranging from you know urban areas in the city of Rochester through a lot of suburban and a lot of uh, rural areas as well. So from an MPO perspective, it can be um, in some cases challenging to develop projects and programs that apply to the entire region. Although one area that uh, does impact the entire region is uh, resiliency and, and vulnerability planning. So this next slide um, sort of gets into the policy basis for the, the GTC's vulnerability assessment. Um, really with our long range transportation plan 2035, which was developed back in 2011, um, and it's been updated twice since then. So our current plan was completed just uh, last year. But one of the key emerging issues that we, we saw was um, preparing the region for the impacts of climate change. Um, and doing this through mitigate, mitigation and adaptation. So um, mitigation being actions or strategies that we can take to lessen the, the impacts of, of climate change in our region. And then adaptation being actions that we can take where we understand that there's going to be changes in weather patterns, you know, flooding, precipitation. And so we have to adapt our uh, infrastructure and services to better withstand those impacts. So from this policy background or policy basis, we identified a specific uh, work task, which was included in our annual um, work program, uh, which is to develop a uh, the regional critical transportation infrastructure vulnerability assessment. Uh, and I apologize, I don't have a, a, a nice um, little uh, acronym for you there, but uh, that was the, uh, the name of the project. So uh, really the, the purpose of the project was, um, was twofold. Um, the first was simply to better understand what our uh, vulnerabilities were to both natural and uh, human caused hazards. So um, I'll explain a little bit more about the difference between those two ideas in a moment. And then the second uh, part of the purpose was to identify um, solutions. So solutions both on a high level sort of regional scale as well as uh, asset specific for the most uh, critical assets in our in our region. So. By way of background information, this was the first time that a project like this had been undertaken for our region. So we were able to build on um, state and county hazard mitigation plans uh, and some other uh, resources that have been developed for emergency response and all of that. But this particular type of study had not been undertaken for our region. So we were kind of, uh, uh, you know, blazing the path here. Um, you know, in, at, in the GTC region, just like in CDTC and all over the state, we have limited funding for uh, infrastructure projects. And so the idea behind developing this plan was to help um, provide an additional source of data for um, allocating our, our federal aid transportation funds and to ensure that, you know, where, where it made sense, where it was appropriate, that um, some of the federal aid resources are being used on projects that were also um, not just sort of uh, routine repair and maintenance or replacement projects, but were designed to um, make infrastructure more resilient or, or uh, more resilient to uh, hazard impacts. We, we took a very broad scope with this project. So we included both infrastructure like roads and bridges, as well as all of the support facilities that are required to operate that infrastructure. So highway garages, operation centers, you know, fuel depot, uh, those kinds of facilities. And then lastly, we wanted to build on uh, some of the climate change adaptation initiatives that had already been uh, or have already been going on around the state. Um, and, and Jen sort of alluded to this in some of her comments a few uh, moments ago, where we're looking at uh, what impacts extreme weather has, you know, it's driving up operations costs, um, increasing repair costs. Uh, and so, again, what can we do to position a region to, to minimize those impacts? So this list, I, I won't go over it all in detail, you can read through it yourself, but basically this is a list of all the agencies that we involved in our project steering committee. We had probably about uh, 60 individuals involved in this committee. Um, and as you can see from reviewing the list, we included uh, representatives from, um, you know, state DOT, local DOTs, you know, state police, transit authority, uh, emergency management, first responders, with the idea being to cast a wide net, so to speak, and um, 
try to bring in as many different viewpoints as possible for, you know, for this project. And I think overall we had uh, good success with doing that. Now, you know, to be fair, some of these organizations, we had to uh, sort of explain why we were inviting them, what we wanted them to um, contribute to this project. But, you know, once we were able to explain that, then I think we got some, some good buy-in and, and good feedback. So I wanted to take a moment and talk about what I mean by uh, critical transportation assets. So at, at a very high level, uh, this is simply um, assets that are um, essential to the functioning of the regional transportation system. So, um, you know, what supports the safety, the efficiency, and the reliability of the, the transportation network. And there are essentially four categories, and this comes from some FHWA guidance on this topic. Um, so infrastructure and facilities that I mentioned earlier, but also equipment and then personnel. For our project, we did not look at the equipment and personnel sides, not that those aren't important, I mean, they are, um, but at least for this initial um, study, we wanted to focus on the infrastructure and the, uh, the facilities. So when I talk about resiliency, again, Jen sort of mentioned this, so I'm not gonna go over this in a great detail. I think our definitions may be a little bit different in detail, but fundamentally the same. Um, resiliency is the ability to adapt uh, to changing conditions and then prepare for uh, and recover from disruption. And ideally, we're looking at enhancing assets to a sort of a new normal. So in the aftermath of an incident event um, of you know, major hazard impact, we're not looking at simply rebuilding a bridge or placing a road as the way it was. We're looking at saying, okay, well, we're going to restore this, this asset, we're going to restore the service, but what can we do to make it more um, resilient to future impacts? Do we increase the elevation of the roadway? Do we um, you know, redesign the bridge piers and abutments so that they're more um, resistant to flooding or scour? Uh, those kinds of questions. Looking at vulnerability, um, so vulnerability is simply a, a feature of the asset that makes it um, vulnerable to, to, to hazard. So a bridge that's located within a floodplain, um, you know, an operation, you know, a transportation service that's operating at certain times where it might be, um, you know, more, uh, more exposed to a hazard impact. And so a vulnerability assessment fundamentally is the process of, of looking at what those asset and system uh, vulnerabilities are and then finding ways to, uh, to mitigate them. So this slide, uh, again, I'm not gonna read through the whole list, you can read it yourself, but this is basically a, um, a list of the key steps in developing a, a vulnerability assessment. Um, I, I tried to kind of boil down uh, all of the guidance and, and advice I got and sort of what are the, the three key things to do. Um, I don't think there's anything really um, you know, uh, controversial about this. I mean, if you look through, you're saying, okay, well, what are our assets? Um, what are the hazards and the hazard impacts? Uh, what are the consequences? How do we prioritize those, those assets? And then how do we, uh, what are the strategies that we can use to, uh, to mitigate the impact of uh, hazard events? Um, and there's already been quite a lot of work done by FHWA, uh, a series of pilot studies that was done, geez, almost uh, 10 years ago now in various parts of the country that we took as the basis for our work, at least from a procedural perspective. Obviously the, the specific needs and concerns of each region are going to be very different. But um, from sort of the overarching process of how you follow through to do this study, um, this is kind of, these are kind of the main steps. Um, of course, nothing is as easy as it seems. There's always a lot of, um, there could be, you know, uh, incomplete information. There could be disagreement over, you know, the true um, hazard extent. So I, I don't want to make it seem, you know, easier than it is, but at least fundamentally, these are the key, uh, the key steps to be aware of. So to give you an example of how we put together an inventory, uh, this map you see is of Wayne County, New York, which is within our sort of the Northeast County in our planning region up against uh, Lake Ontario. Um, and so what we did was we mapped all of the, um, you know, roads, bridges, culverts, railway lines. We looked at you know, highway garages. We looked at, um, we included police, uh, fire stations and those kinds of facilities. We, we didn't really have to, but we decided that we would include those because again, those are important facilities to, um, you know, for supporting uh, either, well, both emergency preparation and emergency response. So, um, you know, if, if you do a, one of these studies on your own, there's no specific requirement as to what you include in your inventory, but these were the facilities that we settled on. And then we generated maps that look kind of like this, where we identified, you know, the roads, um, all the little different little uh, numbers you see here are specific, you know, um, you know fire stations, uh, highway garages, uh, those, kinds of, uh, those kinds of facilities. So the next uh, was to identify and profile hazards. And here we looked at the county, uh, the countywide hazard mitigation plans for all nine counties in our region. And this is sort of the list that came, we came up with. 
Uh, again, I don't think if you're familiar with um, with natural and man-made hazards in New York State, there shouldn't be any big surprises here. You know, I would say probably floods, uh, winter weather, and severe storms are the big three for natural hazards. Um, other things were a little more, um, you know, like landslides. Again, there are certain roads within our, within our region that are uh, susceptible to landslides, but for the most part, I wouldn't say it's a huge issue. Um, same thing with sinkholes, you know, wildfire, certain areas that are going to be more, um, more endangered than others. Um, you know, as for human caused uh, hazards, uh, I used to say man made, but I was told that's no longer a really appropriate term to use, and so now it's a it's human caused. Um, uh, again, things are, I don't think there's anything really surprising here. Um, you know, looking at probably hazardous material spills is one of the big ones. Um, you know, train derailments, um, you know, structural failure. Uh, unfortunately, uh, going back to, for example, the the, um, the I-35 bridge collapse up in Minneapolis back in 2007, I mean, that's always an issue, uh, you know, throughout um, throughout our uh, our transportation system. So, you know, making sure that um, you know, we can do everything we can to prevent those kinds of incidents from happening. Um, so, looking at terms of looking at how we identify um, asset vulnerability, uh, we settled on four key factors. Um, so, you know, the sensitivity, which is the you know, like how sensitive is the transportation system to uh, whether an asset is not out of commission or not. Um, then you've got likelihood, which is what's the, the likelihood or the frequency of a hazard impacting this this uh, asset. Uh, then you've got exposure, which is how um, you know. Uh, you know, what I mentioned earlier, if a bridge is located in a floodplain and it's exposed to flooding versus a bridge that's uh, fairly, you know, has a high elevation, it would not be directly, uh, directly exposed to flooding. And then also the, uh, the consequence on the asset. So what's the severity of the, how the hazard impacts the asset? I mean, is, a, is an asset designed to withstand flooding or some other event or is it, or, or, or is it not? Um, and so basically we came up with a, a ranking system where we looked at these four categories, and this is sort of a um, uh, this is a table that we came up with, sort of a one to five uh, category, where we tried to identify um, how exposed our individual hazards were. Um, I should mention, you know, if you're if you're taking notes, uh, I'll provide the, the slides to Jen, so you'll you'll have this directly to look at. Um, and I should also mention we have a one to, to five, you know, uh, sort of scale here, but that could be easily one to 10 or even one to 50, depending on how much sort of nuance you want to have in, in your process. Um, and this to give you an idea of what the results would be um, uh, going through this. So, you know, just for example, you might have a hazard or might have an asset where it's ranked number two on sensitivity, um, number three in likelihood, number four exposure, number three in consequence. And this is a way we have to kind of balance out um, what the impacts of hazards are going to be on individual uh, assets. And so you'd have a, um, you know, a final, this would be a score of 12, uh, but again, for, for different reasons. And every, every asset's gonna be a little bit different in terms of how it, it ranks in this process. So to give you an idea of what the results would be, this is a map uh, sort of focused in on the city of Rochester and its inner suburbs. And this is for uh, roadway vulnerability. So the the red sections of the roadways you see are, um, are highly vulnerable, uh, ranging down to orange for moderately vulnerable, uh, yellow for moderate, green for moderately low, and blue for low. And there were a variety of factors that went into making these determinations, everything from um, you know, previous exposure to hazards, to uh, traffic volumes, to um, you know, access to critical facilities. And generally speaking, what you see here, the roads that are highly vulnerable, in this case, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're more exposed to hazards, hazards in other facilities, but there are bigger, uh, more important roads from a traffic um, volume perspective. You know, if say uh, Interstate 490 right here were to be knocked out of commission, they would have a much greater disruptive impact on traffic operations than if one of the um, sort of at grade city streets, which is basically the blue network here, uh, were to be affected. And if you notice, one of the in the city, there's a it's not a perfect grid, but there's a there is good uh, connections and access around the city. So if one of these um, roads in here was temporarily knocked out of service, it would certainly be disruptive, certainly you know to the people who live there, to businesses that rely on, on the road for deliveries, but it wouldn't necessarily have the same sort of broad regional impact as uh, a closure on one of the interstates um, or a road like sort of Empire Boulevard or Route 404 over here, which is a major commuter route into the city from the eastern suburbs. Um, and then this is a similar similar results, but looking at bridges instead of roadways. Again, the the big um, oh, and I apologize, there's a, a, a um, formatting issue here, but basically the large 
red uh, triangles you see are the major bridges that, again, if they were to be knocked out of commission, they would have a major uh, negative impact on traffic operations in the region. Um, the replacement costs would be very high, uh, whereas the going down to the small blue triangles, those are bridges that, um, you know, it would still be an issue if they were knocked out of service, but it might not be as disruptive as these few key bridges. Um, and I would point out both with this slide and the previous one that whatever sort of ranking system you come up with, you want to make sure that you um, you have sort of a pyramid effect. They have a relatively small number of assets that are um, ranked highly vulnerable, and then going down through that sort of category of high to moderately high, to, you know, to uh, to moderate and, and down to low. Um, and that's because if you if you do the opposite, if everything if you have most assets are highly vulnerable, then um, it makes it much more difficult to um, you know, focus resources on projects to identify those hazards. Um, so when we looked at uh, sort of the mitigation strategies, we identified these four key themes of prevention, protection, redundancy, and recovery. And again, this was drawn from some FHWA guidance on this topic. So prevention are um, themes or strategies rather that are designed to prevent a hazard from um, impacting a, an asset. Um, protection are actions that you can take when you can't prevent a hazard from happening, like a severe winter storm, but you can design um, an asset in such a way as to that it's protected from the, those impacts. Um, and then you've got redundancy, and we looked at both micro and macro redundancy here. So micro redundancy is asset specific. So that's, you, you probably heard the term uh, fracture critical, so a bridge with a fracture critical uh, component or element is a bridge that would collapse if that one element was damaged or destroyed. So how do we design our assets um, that, you know, or how do we redesign and rebuild them so that there are no, um, you know, fracture critical elements? It may be a tall order, not something that's going to happen overnight, but in terms of a, a long-term um, plan to work towards, that's something that we try to, uh, we, we promoted. And then um, system redundancy is when you're looking at your entire transportation system and um, you have sort of what I mentioned earlier about the city of Rochester and their, their, uh, their local uh, streets, um, you know, if, if an asset were to be knocked out of commission, are there good detour routes? Are there other ways to um, divert traffic to, to minimize the disruption of those services? And lastly, with recovery, that includes both short-term and long-term uh, activities. So short-term is the immediate emergency response. Long-term is the long-term restoration to that sort of new normal that we're not just replacing the bridge in kind, but um, you are, uh, again, rebuilding it so that it's more, it's, it's better protected against a hazard impact. Um, you know, a short-term uh, response or, or recommendation could be something like, um, like what I mentioned earlier with some of our critical road segments that are provide direct access to a fire station or a hospital is uh, designing assets so that um, when there is an, a, a, an emergency response, so that emergency response is not um, negatively hampered by um, or negatively impacted by, uh, by hazard events. And uh, a few more slides to go here. So, these categories are the, the five main categories that all those um, uh, strategies were organized into, uh, mostly in the um, planning and policy and infrastructure and construction strategies. Um, and so, you know, for planning and policy, that included, you know, recommendations like um, intermunicipal and uh, interagency resource sharing, uh, looking at ITS, you know, intelligent transportation systems, and sort of how we monitor and manage traffic operations on the roadway. Um, looking at into, including uh, flood mitigation, you know, flooding for our region, like for, for the Albany area, is a key uh, natural hazard to prepare for. So it's basically on the, on the planning policy side, you know, what can we do to, to safeguard our infrastructure? And then the, the infrastructure and construction category includes things like um, relocation and elevation of assets, you know, green infrastructure to, to mitigate flooding, um, slope stabilization, you know, things like that. Um, as for the, the communication, education, and awareness, that's something that's really more, it's into like public outreach, but that's something that's kind of integrated into um, an actual project that a city or county might, might, might take on as part of, you know, building a new bridge or rebuilding a roadway. There'd be sort of a public uh, engagement component to that. Um, the natural and land resource protection gets into things, um, again, like protecting, um, you know, floodplains and wetlands, you know, keeping infrastructure out of those areas. Uh, and then operations and maintenance are things that seem very simple, but it has a major benefit, and that's you know maintaining uh, culverts, for example, and you know periodically cleaning them out, cleaning out storm drains, um, making sure that uh, or doing what you can to uh, to mitigate the impacts of flooding. Um, and uh, so, 
sort of wrapping up here, um, I, I broke down a, a few sort of key lessons that that we learned uh, through going by going through this process. Um, in some ways, the planning process is just as important as the final product because you establish partnerships, you get to understand different agencies' issues and concerns and how they can coordinate and, and work together, and that's always very important. Um, you look at how uh, vulnerability-related considerations can be integrated into the, the transportation infrastructure investment decision-making process. And so again, um, I've mentioned this a few times, a key, a key point for us to do this project was to um, sort of maximize the use of our federal aid funding and say, okay, well, we're not just going to rebuild a road or rebuild a bridge when the time comes to, to do that. Well, we're gonna make sure that we include um, or that we factor in you know, floodplain issues, um, slope issues, those kinds of things. Um, and then also sort of the, the role in vulnerability assessments to um, in helping local officials make decisions on land use and policies, you know, when it comes to um, setting a new, you know, fire station, you know, things like that. You, you can't obviously, you know, mandate anyone uh, look at these kinds of issues uh, when they do that, but you can at least bring this up as a source of information for, uh, for local officials to consider. Um, so on that note, I think I probably went a bit, a bit long here. Um, I guess we'll probably maybe hold questions until the end, but I'm, I'm happy to, you know, um, well, we always try to aim for success. Um, uh, you know, I'm happy to answer questions. I will mention too that the, the final product we did is available on the GTC website. So I can provide that link to Jen. Um, Jen, if you want to send that out to the uh, to your, your uh, group. So thank you. Thanks so much, Joe. Um, if anyone has questions, they can put them in the chat or the Q&A and um, Stephen from our staff will be monitoring that and we'll answer them at the end. Um, so with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Lucas. Lucas, you should be able to share your screen. Thank you. And as I do that, Jen, is it possible to unmute uh, Liz King so that she can chime yeah. in uh, as throughout a little bit? So um, I just permitted Liz to talk. Um, so I don't know, Liz, you want to test it out and make sure it's working? Yeah, I think I'm all set. Can you hear me? Perfect. Now? Cool. Great. Perfect. So I, thank you. Uh, it's Let me start the slideshow. And it's great to be here to present, um, but also to, to learn and to hear from the other presenters and from Jen about <clears throat> all the great things that everybody's doing. I'm here today to speak about Albany County's Climate Resiliency Plan. Uh, this is something that the county executive tasked us with seeking a grant from the Department of State to implement. And we were one of five counties throughout the state to receive the, a smart growth planning grant focused on climate resiliency. Um, as you heard, uh, we have <coughs> Uh, brought on a, a consultant to manage the project for us, and that is Bergman Associates. And so I also have Liz King on today um, to add and, and more likely to correct me when I misspeak. But um, this all starts with, with why, and this is somewhat um, repetitive to what both Jen and Joe spoke about, but this really is a local issue. And, and when we make decisions about what grants to apply for and, and what policies to, to pursue, it's worth noting and remembering that this has real local impact. So these are just a few instances about, uh, or examples of extreme weather in the capital region in Albany County. And, and you can, you know, it, it gives it a sense of reality and to visualize it. Um, this is from yesterday. So we, we know uh, extreme weather is increasing. Um, fortunately, you know, um, aside from some power outages, it seems like we were mostly spared yesterday, but, but extreme weather events due to climate change are happening more frequently and when they do happen are, are more severe. And so that's, that's another why. Um, and, and lastly, the climate stressors result in real issues, and, and each of these issues has an impact on Albany County, whether it's road closures due to washout, which we certainly saw during uh, Hurricane Irene and um, other hurricanes earlier in the 2010s, um, 
bridge damage, disruption to airports and ports and railways. We are, you know, a fortunate county in that we are somewhat sort of transportation infrastructure rich. We have uh, the, the main local airport in the area. We have two ports that are deep water ports on the Hudson that are, are now serving or will be serving the offshore wind industry uh, in New York State. And we have significant rail and public transit infrastructure as well. So these are, these are real impacts that we feel at a local level. Um, and you know, cost and, and maintenance. Um, each time one of these uh, extreme weather events happens, there's significant increase in cost in repair and maintenance. And we all go through the FEMA process that some of you might uh, be familiar with to try and, and get additional funding to support that. But it, it has an impact on, on running a county, on, on running a municipality, and it has an impact on our our businesses and our, our citizens. So this is the model that the Climate Resiliency Plan is based upon. If you have ever um, completed or if you're familiar with a, a hazard mitigation plan, which is a FEMA product or project, it's fairly similar. And, and what this program did with Department of State was sort of take that model and really lean into um climate risks and really lean into sort of smart growth planning and principles and it's almost a supplement to build off of a hazard mitigation plan which counties are required to complete every five years and we worked on this and are working on this in between our two uh you know the completion of our last hazard mitigation plan and the start of our next so throughout it, we've been really looking at ways to, um, you know, how do we avoid duplicating work and how do we do, how do we allow the work that we're doing here to um, leverage our, our next hazard mitigation plan? We don't want to repeat, but if, if we do a good job with this, it's going to allow us to go even further with the hazard mitigation plan. Um, I want to pause and just highlight one note, which is that it's sort of an interesting time to to talk about the climate re resiliency plan that the county is doing because we are right in the middle of it. Um, we are not uh, at plan completion where I would say about two thirds of the way through. So we are, um, I can't give you all the answers, but I can certainly talk about the process and, and where we are today. So county profile resiliency vision and um, the asset inventory was the first major product of this report. And it's based on and broken into the different FEMA recovery frameworks, um, health and social services, infrastructure systems, for example. And, and what we did was sort of a hybrid, a combination of pulling from public sources, uh, many of which are listed here, but also um, relying on, on local knowledge. So in addition to significant stakeholder meetings and uh, a municipal working group, which I'll speak to in a little bit more detail in a minute, we created a, an interactive mapper. I say we, Bergman created an interactive mapper that could be shared with our partners and they could actually go in, log in and input both assets and sort of con areas of concern, whether, you know, areas of the road or culverts where they frequently have seen flooding in the past or a, a town hall or church that they know serves a, a special or important cultural value in the community uh, to really supplement what was publicly available. And I, I think that was a, a helpful tool to be able to to blend the, the resources in the clearinghouse and elsewhere with local knowledge. And so what we've done is created this asset inventory and, um, you know, and mapped it. And I don't know how interactive this is. I was going to use this as a, a quiz to see if people could guess which, uh, which one of these is which, but I, I'm not sure if, you know, maybe people can, whoops, can, uh, 
enter into the chat or maybe I'll just just go over it. Um, this one should be pretty easy um, based on the topic of today's uh, presentation, but this is the transportation assets within the county. Um, this is housing. This is health and human services organizations. And you know you can see the clusters in some of the more densely populated areas and as you might expect. And, and this last one is um, natural and, and cultural resources. And so step one is get the inventory, get, get your, you know, lay your groundwork for the rest of the study. Um, and, and once we had that inventory, we moved into the risk assessment phase, uh, which, you know, somewhat similar to, to what Joe was talking about is how do you assign value and how do you evaluate the, um, the risk associated with these climate risks? And, and we've, we know what they are in this area. It's, it's not a secret. It is the flooding. It is the extreme storms. And we also focused on heat. So flood, heat, and, and overlaying all of that with social vulnerability. Um, this map on the right is one piece of that puzzle, which is impervious cover. Um, you know, you can see the urbanized area as <laughs> again. Um, and as you get out into our suburbs here, and then out into the more rural areas, the impervious cover decreases. Um, and so we used these data sources um, for flood, Department of State, local knowledge, and the First Street Foundation data sets. Um, heat is based on, uh, that might suppose, I think that maybe is supposed to say DOH, but the Heat Vulnerability Index. And then social vulnerability um, based on CDTC and, and EJ. And this map here is for the heat vulnerability, um, the map that identifies the, the most vulnerable areas. And before I go on to the next section, Liz, if, if this might be a good um, spot for you to just add a little bit more um, depth to the, the methodology that we took for the risk assessment, because you can speak to it a little bit better than I can, if that's all right. Sure. Um, so for the, the flood risk, and I think maybe you know one of our main challenges with the flood risks is we had data sets with differential coverages across the county. Um, so we did have the 100-year FEMA floodplains, and those are luckily relatively recently mapped for Albany County, um, which did give us good countywide coverage. But that really is kind of a snapshot in time. And because this is a climate resilience plan, we really wanted a data set that captured more of the future risks associated with flooding. Um, the Department of State has developed risk areas for the ocean coast areas, and they just recently have developed a risk area data set for the tidal Hudson River. Um, so we were referencing that data set to understand um, future flood risks along the Hudson River, um, which is really the eastern boundary of Albany County. Um, that data set takes into account not only the FEMA regulatory floodplain, but also looks at sea level rise projections, coastal storm and Sergo data um, to start to incorporate the different, different considerations related to climate change. Um, the biggest challenge with that is that while it's a great resource for along the Hudson River, it doesn't cover any of the inland portions of Albany County. Um, so we settled on using a data set produced by First Street Foundation, which is a nonprofit, kind of a consortium of scientists and academics, and they've developed hydrological models um, nationwide. And those models not only take into account fluvial flooding, so fluvial flooding being when a water body overtops, um, but it also considers historical flooding events, pluvial flooding, which is really where you have a, you have an intense rainstorm, often you'll get flooding based on your topography or your soils um, or even infrastructure. So it does capture those areas. Um, and it also, and I think, you know, one of the reasons we really liked this data set and felt like it was a good fit for our project is because it has integrated um, 
climate change projections into their flood models. So we were able to obtain data sets, um, raster data sets that showed the likelihood, essentially the depth of flooding with different storm events. So like a one in five year storm versus a one in 100 year or a one in 500 year storm. And we were able to get those for three different time intervals. So for 2020, 2035 and 2050. Um, they also provided us part of that data set of flood risk score. Um, and that is essentially a score based on a kind of parcels um, probability that it will flood over a 30 year time period, which is the typical lifespan of a mortgage and the depth to which it will flood. So areas with a higher flood risk are ones that are going to flood to deeper depths more frequently and ones with a lower flood score or flood risk or those that will experience infrequent flooding and when they do experience flooding it would be very low depths um, so we ultimately use that first street foundation data set to develop to develop a countywide um, risk map related to flooding and we've done all of our mapping and um, risk assessments down to the parcel level. So each parcel um, within Albany County has received a flood score, a heat vulnerability score, and then also a social vulnerability score. And then across those three indices, we've summed them to just get a, a general composite or a general sense and a composite score for climate change vulnerability at the parcel level. And I will note, don't, um, Luke, you were right. It is the Department of Health um, who has developed the Heat Vulnerability Index. That data set is available um, statewide and it's down to the census tract level. Great, thank you. Yeah, typo on my part, but thank you, Liz. Okay. <clears throat> um, and I just wanted to touch on the public engagement component of this because it is a key piece of the puzzle and this will allow me a little bit to touch on some of the transportation related components of, of the project. So we had five different uh, ways that we are engaging the public. One is through a, a technical advisory committee, which is really sort of the practitioners and the technicians. So, you know, Jen from the from CDTC representing the MPO, our, our regional planning organization, some of our our state partners like DEC, um, some of our, our county staff and officials from our, you know, our sewer and our stormwater and um, sort of to oversee from a technical standpoint, the project. Um, municipal working group with representatives from each of the 19 municipalities within the county as, as indicated, local knowledge is, is an important part of this equation. Uh, significant stakeholder meetings that um, we, you know, we identified a list of key stakeholders, which seemed to keep growing as we knocked them off um, from throughout the community, sort of in different categories, uh, public meetings and events, community workshops, and then a project website. And I just wanted to share, um, you know, one of the tools that, that Bergman suggested we use is when we, this was, a lot of this was sort of the heart of, uh, pandemic and in-person meetings were out of the equation, but how do you still provide uh, that opportunity for sort of real-time feedback, which you can get in a physical room sometimes, but is tougher online. And um, this tool called Mentimeter we used, and it allowed us to pose, and I'm sure you've seen this or other versions of this um, in your day-to-day, -day, but it allowed us to pose questions and get real-time answers. And a lot of those answers um, had a transportation component to them. So what are the systems and assets that play a critical role in our quality of life? You can see, I think three out of the nine responses here have a transportation nexus, safe roads and bridges, transportation infrastructure. Um, and I think transportation infrastructure is listed again. Please, uh, you know, your example of a climate adaptation or mitigation project. So what's going on now? And you see many of these have a transportation component. Electrification of our public transit fleet, bike share. So mobility options um, through bike, through scooters, through uh, 
shared mobility options. And uh, as you can see, coming soon busways. And I promise Jen didn't provide every single one of these answers. There were there were many stakeholders that that provided that input. Um, and just a, a visioning exercise of in 2080, which is further out than you know most of us can comprehend, but what innovative steps will Albany County have taken to adapt and mitigate? And again, more transportation choices, county trails system, mobility as a service. So you can see the nexus between uh, climate resiliency and transportation really came to the forefront when, as part of much of the, the uh, public engagement that we did. Uh, and, and lastly, you know, as I mentioned, we are not uh, we're not done with this plan. We're maybe two thirds of the way through. So the phase we're entering now, which is, you know, arguably the most important. But what are the you know now we have all this information? What are the projects and strategies that we are going to recommend or, or work with partners to implement? And we are really just in the formulation stage right now. But some early you know, hence the question marks next to each of them, but some early ideas that have been been thrown out there, you know, a countywide culvert analysis to have a better handle on our infrastructure, um, expanding green infrastructure and nature-based approaches on county and non-county properties, including transportation projects. So I know we've started to do that at the county level with our DPW, our, our public works department projects, trying to implement green infrastructure um, where we can uh, when we're redoing roads, um, primarily in our suburban and rural communities. Uh, expanding on our trail network to provide um, not just recreation, but also alternative transportation modes, uh, trans transit-oriented development, and uh, continuing to expand the network for charging stations. And, and I'll just add, at the county level, we're looking um, pretty aggressively at how we convert our, our own fleet to zero emissions vehicles as well. So these are far from uh, final, but start, you know, they're starting the conversation and we will be completing this project in fall of this year. So we're happy to, you know, keep everybody updated on, on where things shake out. So with that, I will uh, stop my share and um, hand it back over in, in last actually let me say uh, Liz is there anything that you think I uh, missed or that you want to add from from your perspective um no I think that was a great summary and we'll also let you all know we're planning to have a series of public events this summer too to provide more information about the project and also get feedback on the proposed project so we'll share that information with Jen so she can distribute too Great, thanks. And with that, I'll send it back to Jen. Thanks, Luke, and thanks, Liz. Um, so to wrap this up, I just have a couple more things. Um, if I can remember. <laughs> All right. Okay, I think we can all see my slides again. Great. So um, Joe and Luke both um, gave us a lot of really great information. Um, I know I was taking a lot of notes because there's a lot of stuff that I think that as CDTC moves forward with um, identifying vulnerable assets and developing in um, a resiliency and adaptation plan, um, this is going to be really useful. But um, for folks who are looking for other um, CDC, CDTC products or information that might be helpful in their local planning efforts, um, CDTC's linkage, community and transportation linkage program um, has yielded about 100 studies um, over the last 20 years. And we have an archive of transportation and land use studies on our website. Um, also the congestion management plan, which was done um, 
with our Metropolitan Transportation Plan in 2020 is available. Uh, we have a coordinated public human transit human service transportation plan and public participation policy that also has strategies that your community can use for um, enhanced public engagement. The Capital District Trails Plan, our local road safety action plan, the zero emission vehicle plan, and the regional freight and goods movement plan. Um, we have a lot of ongoing studies also. Um, and uh, we have recently released a solicitation for the CDTC and Capital District Regional Planning Commission's technical assistance program. So if your community has a small scale planning study that you um, are exploring, definitely uh, touch base with CDTC or CDRPC and we can talk about a scope and a budget. Um, and those projects can range from just data collection to local trail planning to data analysis and other community plans. Um, we also uh, continue to collect and develop uh, infrastructure inventories and databases. We have a sidewalk inventory, a bicycle infrastructure inventory, a, and a trail database. We are developing a bike and trail count census database. Um, we have a number of survey templates and data we're happy to share as well as safety data and information. CDTC often has funding available, um, federal transportation planning and other funds uh, for transportation planning and for implementation of capital projects. The Capital Go Coexist Mini Grants Program is a, is a small traffic safety program that supports local bicycle and pedestrian safety um, outreach events like demonstration projects or community events led by law enforcement. Um, it's, they're not currently open, but the Transportation Alternatives Program and Congestion Mitigation and Air Quality Programs both support um, uh, bicycle and pedestrian and other uh, transportation projects that reduce greenhouse gas emissions like roundabouts um, and other projects. Recreational Trails Program, um, also, uh, it's actually managed by the New York State Office of Parks, Recreation, and Historic Preservation. And then, of course, the um, Unified Planning Work Program, CEDC, just started a new fiscal year. So we have, we're in a new UPWP. Um, so this is one year of tasks for CDTC. So for this year, that includes uh, identifying vulnerable assets. Um, and then, of course, a number of other resources can be found on the CDTC website cdtcmpo.org. Um, so we'll open the chat in Q&A. Um, if anyone has any additional questions for the panel, I know um, one thing I, as CDTC is preparing to develop our, you know, gathering data and develop inventories, um, as a, Luke, what you mentioned about having the interactive mapper and really relying on that local institutional knowledge um, was something I made note of because I think that as we try and look for data or already assembled like databases and realizing that a lot of this is gonna have to, we're, we're kind of starting from scratch, I think um, for a lot of the region and we'll have to rely on uh, you know, local DPW, local engineers, and um, and folks have really let us know like where where are the areas that flood a lot, or where are the culverts that they, you know, that they worry about. Um, so I've made a note to look into interactive mapping applications <laughs> for when we begin. Yeah, that was a I thought a creative way to approach it, and I, I think in the beginning we had to sort of force it out of people a little bit, um, just because everybody's busy and it's a new um, approach. But I think we ended up getting a a lot of good information from that, and it ended up being sort of verified by some of the data sets in a lot of ways, which is good. But then uh, you know there were others that maybe aren't captured in the data sets that are just local knowledge where people who drive the streets and and maintain the infrastructure uh really have that concept mm -hmm. 
I'll just throw in there real quickly one important resource that we use that I, I mentioned on the call was the countywide all hazard mitigation plans um, because those typically would include uh, some sort of inventory information. So that might be a good place for people to, to start with as well. So. Stephen, do you see any? I don't see anything in the chat. Nope. Okay. All right. So um, we don't have any additional questions, but um, people can always reach out by email. CDCC is on social media, and um, you can find information on our website. This webinar will be on our YouTube channel, um, which will then go on the CDTC website. Um, and we can, you know, link to other important information. I have slides, we can PDF them and provide them. So I just want to thank Joe and Lucas um, for, for participating today. Really appreciate it. And also Stephen and Liz, thanks. Thanks for helping out. And um, we hope to see everyone next month. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Have a good afternoon. Thank you, Jen. Yep. Bye. Bye.